Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Keim. I'm Stenton's curator, and I'm excited today that we have Sarah Gadula with us from Materials Conservation to present uh, about Stenton's roof research and study that we did this year in 2020 before the big COVID shutdown in conjunction with re-roofing um, the mansion. So here at the, I'm just at the outset showing you a little bit of that roof work going on. The um, installation of the shingles was done by Kurtz Construction Company based in Winmore, just outside of Chestnut Hill. And the funding for the work came from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, the McLean Contribution Ship, and from the Stenton Restoration Fund. So we are really grateful we were able to assemble these funds from the state and generous donors to keep this National Historic Landmark um, in good condition and keep the water out as the roof really is key to keeping Stenton well preserved. I just wanted to let you know too, for those of you who might not know about um, the roof structure, originally Stenton had a cupola on top at the center and there was a balustrade or a railing. So you can imagine a cupola kind of right here and a balustrade around the top of the, um, the hip of the roof. This shape of roof is called a hip roof. And so it has four distinct sides and Stenton's roof has um, three dormers across the, the long facades front and back. And then um, one on its sort of more Eastern side and two on its more Western side providing the light for the garret spaces. Um, and so we asked materials conservation to be involved for a couple of reasons, but um, one of the conservators there, Andrew Fearon, also teaches in the graduate program in historic preservation at the University of Pennsylvania. And with his students, um, some of the, the students were studying the effects of different kinds of stains and coatings that could be applied to these cedar shingles to pro prolong their life. Um, so that was one piece. Um, but we also had Andrew and Sarah on site investigating the roof framing structure just to learn more about it. Well, we had the opportunity with it somewhat opened up. And um, we also were looking at the chimneys just because they were rebuilt in the 1950s by restoration architect G. Edwin Brumball. Um, and we learned actually that they were not just rebuilt, but the, the masonry was coated at that time. And so Sarah will tell you, um, I think, some more about that. Um, and I should just mention that we, we know the roof was done in the 1950s. We know it was done again in the 1980s and well documented that that took place. Um, and so here we are 2020, um, you know, really having gotten a full life out of the most recent shingles. And I should say these, the shingles we have now on the roof are a um, Western red cedar that actually came from um, Western Canada. So that was a way we were able to cut, start to approach the 18th century type of shingle at um, a more affordable cost for, for Stenton. And just as I'm getting ready to introduce Sarah here, I wanted to show you from our historic structures report, this is from 1982 um, investigations they did find um, when they lifted a floorboard near one of the chimneys in the garret, this is sort of the wall of the chimney under the floorboard, um, they found some original shingles or what they believe were original roof shingles because um, the floor would not have been finished yet when the house was framed and going up and the roof was put on. And so sort of refuse pieces would get caught um, and, and sort of built into the floor underneath. And so, it talks about um, this in this masonry cavity, discarded and broken roof shingles identified as original, and they called it an unusual 32 inches in length. And I also wanted to share with you one other historic document we have. This is a James Logan ledger from the 1720s um, documenting some construction that took place in 1720 in the 11th month. Um, but this would not be for Stenton. Stenton would not have been roofed this early date. And this was a time that James Logan was probably adapting an existing building and working on an existing building that was at part of Stenton Plantation when he was purchasing the land. And we know he adapted a house 
for his mother to live in. Um, and so it may be that house, but he is um, saying that by the Germantown mill, so obtained from the Germantown mill, 1,000 of three foot shingles. So that unusual length of 32 inches and, and three feet are um, somewhat in line and gives you a sense of the way 18th century um, framing and, and shingling could work. So with that, I'm very pleased to um, introduce to you our speaker, Sarah Gadula. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let her get hers set up. Sarah is an architectural conservator um, and started her path in an unconventional place. She had a BA in Asian studies from Temple University. And she was at the time working as a tour guide at Shifuzo, the Japanese house in Fairmount Park. And her curiosity was piqued by a graduate student conducting thesis research at that site. Sarah then found herself at the University of Pennsylvania's graduate program in historic preservation and um, joined Materials Conservation Collaborative as a summer intern and then coming after graduation to, to work for the company. One of the projects she's worked on is um, reimagining Al Capone's cell at Eastern State Penitentiary. And Sarah is just an excellent archival research researcher as well as having incredible technical skills as far as architectural investigation um, and materials analysis. So she combines all of these expertises together um, to really pull um, a very complete picture of the projects that she works on. And um, I should mention that she's continued her, her uh, interest in Japanese culture and one of her hobbies is classical Japanese dance. So with that, Sarah, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, you know, uh, share our research and our findings for this project. It was really interesting to go up on the roof. Uh, such a really well-preserved site. It's a great, knowledgeable staff, so it's really good to work with you guys. Uh, so just want to, you know, put out all the players here. We have Materials Conservation, uh, the firm I work for, the, obviously Stenton. Uh, Kurtz Construction Company did the actual reshingling, and then the students of the UPenn um, 2020 uh, Historic Preservation Wood Seminar uh, did a lot of research uh, on some of the, on the other things as well. So real quick, I wanted to start off with what does an architectural conservator do? Because not everyone realizes exactly what we do as, you know, a profession. And it really depends on which part of uh, the teams that you're, uh, that we work on. So not all firms do the same things, uh, like architects, lawyers, doctors, we all have specialties. Uh, so uh, sometimes it's just paint, sometimes it's masonry. We like to think that we do a lot of everything, that we can do a lot, we have a lot of, you know, we can look at buildings as a whole and kind of see them as a system, not just, you know, individual pieces. So obviously the project hierarchy, the owner is the site manager. They have a certain goal. They have, you know, things they want to achieve. And then they uh, hire a design team and a contractor to come help out. So sometimes we're on the design team. Uh, so whenever we're this, we're usually doing the initial delving into it. Uh, so how can you determine what a project is if you don't know, you know, the extent of the scope or anything. Uh, so there's always hidden conditions. Uh, so it's always good to, you know, get hands on and get a good design team in there. Uh, so usually the team is a bunch of different people. It could be architects, engineers, conservators, a whole team of like lighting specialists, HVAC professionals, plumbers, uh, fire and safety uh, people. So a whole team of people working together to create a whole project. So what do we do on the design team? Um, like Laura mentioned, we do a lot of archival research, uh, field surveys and condition assessments, materials analysis, uh, treatment recommendations, specifications, and if needed, we can do uh, produce some architectural drawings as well. So whenever we're doing archival research uh, for this initial push, what are we looking for? So honestly, I'll take anything. Uh, it can be photographs, anything on this list here. Uh, you never know where you're going to find a nice piece of information. Um, Wikipedia is not, you know, only scratches the surface. Google does not know all. You really have to dive into a good archive and be prepared to go on different tangents to go find things. Uh, so like I said, you never really know what you're going to find. Uh, for instance, uh, one of these postcards on the up left, upper left here, um, 
I found this beautiful plaster ceiling behind some drop, uh, behind some drop ceiling because of this postcard. Uh, so you never know, you might find interesting names on deeds or, you know, uh, archival information um, specifications. There was one job that I worked on where we found specifications for the original building in a pile of old papers and they told us exactly what we needed to know, the varnish on a piece, uh, some of the painting. So really be prepared to dive into anything. Uh, where do you find it? There's a whole slew of places to start. Uh, not one place has, you know, there's little bits and pieces all over the place. Not one collection has everything. So these are good places to start, um, but be prepared to, you know, go anywhere. So the first thing we need to do is really understand a building whenever we start a project. Um, on the left here, we have the uh, steps of procedures for the Borough Charter. So the Borough Charter is um, basic principles and procedures for the conservation of heritage buildings. You can't just jump into, you know, conserving something without knowing anything about it. For instance, uh, on the right here, this is the Federal Reserve Bank, the old Federal Reserve Bank, I should say, on uh, 10th and Chestnut. So it appears to be one whole building from the outside, but unless you really know that all these bits and pieces came together and they have, you know, there might be some things that were the join uh, that really can inform your, your treatment recommendations. So something that I kind of specialize in is field surveys and condition assessments. Uh, condition assessment is an investigation, review, and report on the state of a building's conditions, including all their structural systems and uh, systems like uh, HVAC, uh, et cetera. So it's interior, exterior, they're all part of the same building. You can't look at one without the other. So here we actually see um, condition assessment we did for Stenton last 2019. Uh, on the stucco of the service will, uh, wing. So we were doing some cap testing to see where it had delaminated, detached a little bit, where there was voids behind the stucco, where previous repairs had been, um, exposures. We did find some really interesting um, uh, ceramic pieces in some of this, uh, you know, pieces of glazed pottery and things which are really interesting to, to find. So you never know that's there until you really get up and look at it closely. Um, so you need to know all angles. You can't just, you know, look at the building. You need to be able to get up, down, wherever, be able to make some exposures if you, uh, if you can. That way you can see, you know, the full depth of the building. And we always take this physical information and we cross-reference it with our archival information. Uh, for instance, uh, on, the, on the right here, you can see that's part of the condition assessment for the stucco. And we were wondering why we had this large band of uh, detachment at the top. If we go back into this, um, the site records, there's this uh, photo from 1985 where you can see they had done some patching right along the edge of that whenever they took an old roof off. So it appears that the stuck was not really adhering to that patching material very well and therefore we're finding detachments. We can find reasons behind the conditions that we're seeing based on some archival information as well. Uh, on the left there, that's a uh, stone that was cracking and you, you don't know why it's cracking until maybe you look at the drawing, you see there's an iron beam there. Uh, so they can really help inform each other, the physical investigation and the archival research. So some, a lot of things we do is materials analysis and testing. Uh, so we, we do paint analysis, we can figure out what kind of pigments were used, cleaning tests, mortar analysis, uh, basically the whole gamut, we can, we can poke and prod it and figure it out. So what do we do with all this information once we, you know, collect it? Uh, we develop treatments and we work with sites to help them, you know, achieve the goals that they're trying to, you know, to, to set out for. So we do um, technical specifications if we personally are not doing the job ourselves. That way a contractor can take that and have all the information they need to go and do the job. Uh, we also help sites prioritize based on, you know, um, conditions that we find, which ones are worse than others, which ones can be kind of deferred, which ones need immediate attention, et cetera. So not all conservators do the contractor's end. Um, materials conservation, we do both, design and build. Uh, so we do apply a lot of hands-on conservation treatments. Uh, for instance, Laura mentioned we replastered Al Capone Cell at Eastern State Penitentiary. So we went and we actually found the historic colors. We went and did an analysis there. And we, uh, coupled with this, um, the site who had found some new archival information about what was in the cell, we did a whole reinterpretation of that. Uh, so we really like to put our hands on things and get to know it. Uh, we do some injection grouting. 
uh, in the center, in the, um, the lower center, that's a marble tesserae floor that had kind of like bubbled up a little because there are iron beams underneath that were cracking, general cleaning, et cetera. We do a lot of specialty things as well. Uh, for instance, um, on the far right is the regilding of the Joan of Arc statue by the Art Museum. Um, on the far left, we did some analysis of the columns at Monticello and found that they use this really interesting sand technique uh, to finish it, and we, uh, the team uh, reapplied that. Then we also moved uh, some things as well. We moved the love sculpture whenever we had it under conservation and other large sculptures. So getting down to actually what we were doing at Stenton, uh, we were brought in to check out the roof framing and the chimneys. So assess the general condition, uh, conditions of the brick, uh, take two mortar samples for, uh, for analysis, do some rylum testing, um, and then field observations. Uh, same thing for the roof field observations, take some wood samples to see what kind of wood they are, et cetera. So I wanna say that the guys at Kurtz work really, really fast. <laughs> So by the time we got on site, they had one and a half parts of the roof already done, sides of the roof already done. Um, and this is one of the few instances where the archival information came later. Uh, usually I like to delve into the archives and get to know everything beforehand. Uh, but it was really interesting in this uh, instance because we didn't go in with any preconceived notions of what we might find. Um, so we immediately, uh, like Laura said, they. Um, in 19, the 1980 roofing uh, procedure, they found some of the old shingles. So the roofers knew exactly what to go off of for that. So once we got on site, I immediately got up to the top of the roof. Um, like Laura mentioned, uh, there used to be a cupola up top and a balustrade um, because apparently Logan really enjoyed astronomy and he said he couldn't see the sky from the windows. So he made sure that he had a place to go up on the very top of the roof. So I was interested in, initially just to get up there to see if I could find any, um, any uh, evidence of that, but unfortunately the metal roofing covers all of that. So on the right you can see that's a conjectural drawing of what it might have looked like. Um, this is based off of some sketches, uh, this is from 1823, um, so sometimes if it takes with a grain of salt, it might not be, you know, it's a sketch, it might not be, it's not a photograph, uh, but it's generally believed that uh, it was proved that there was a cupola there based off of the joists and the masonry. Uh, and it was believed that it had a balustrade there as well. So while I was up on the roof, uh, checking out the chimneys on the, on the right there, Andrew was also on site, and he immediately delved into trying to find some more uh, information in those little places that you don't always think. So just like they found the, uh, uh, the shingle in the 1980s, we were looking for uh, original material. And specifically in this instance, we were looking for maybe um, evidence of finishes on the roofing materials. We, were, we don't really know a lot about what it looked like originally. So we were really interested in trying to find something along those lines. All right, so I started off with a visual assessment of the chimneys. Uh, initially, I could see there's some open joints at the top, um, some mortar popping out. This is not uncommon for you know older masonry, but the thing that really, really caught my eye was the photo on the right. Now, we were up there in February, and it hadn't rained for about three days. So whenever I saw this pattern of water, I was kind of intrigued because there shouldn't be any kind, you know, it hadn't rained, there was no other water uh, processes going on with the re-roofing procedures. So I took note of that, and I started with my rylum testing. So the rylum test is uh, based off of a, a French uh, test where we take this tube and we attach it to the wall with a putty, a waterproof putty, and we fill up with five milliliters of water and we time it, um, to time how long it takes the water to be absorbed into the masonry. Um, so starting off, uh, I started off with the uh, joints and it took a long time. Uh, so if you see the, the data on the right there, it's 18 minutes and 28 minutes for it to fully absorb into the joints. Initially, I thought maybe this was because it was a Portland cement, like a harder, uh, less porous, uh, less breathable material that was used on the brick. However, I also did rylum testing on the brick faces themselves. And I purposefully chose a brick that didn't have a fire skin. So a fire skin on a brick is kind of like the crust of bread. Uh, it's like a harder, um, 
material whenever it's fired, it's, it's more exposed to the air and is able, um, and it kind of protects the softer stuff inside. Uh, a lot of historic preservation projects actually arise because someone doesn't realize that fire skin is a thing and they maybe try to blast off paint or something along those lines and they actually remove the fire skin in the process. These are older historic bricks from the 1700s, so um, firing techniques were not as great as they were in the 1800s, 1900s, so it was a relatively soft brick. So whenever I put the Rylum test on this brick, I immediately thought I was going to suck it up right away. And that proved to be not the case. Uh, it actually took nearly over a half an hour uh, for it to get about a half a milliliter down, which is really, really strange. And this is where we kind of came to the conclusion that maybe there is a coating on the brick because it should have been able to, they should be so porous that it should have just sucked it right up. Um, so after we started, uh, finished with the chimneys, we did a little bit of a roof framing survey on the spaces that were available to us. We took some running measurements of all the, uh, all the roofing members. Um, and we also took a couple samples. We took two samples of uh, roof sheathing members and also a sample of the rafters. Now, what do we do with this once we have the samples? So we take it back to, to our lab and we have to finish the top with a really fine tooth saw first and then we finish it with a really, really sharp razor. And this is to expose the, the end grain, basically, uh, the anatomy, the microstructure of the wood. So if you think of wood as basically a series of straws that are put together um, that allows the capillary, you know, by capillary action, the water sucks it up and keeps, uh, goes up and into these tubes and keeps the tree alive. So once we are able to, once we learn the anatomy of the wood, we're able to um, uh, make inferences and actually tell exactly which kind of species it is. So on this first sample, it was interesting because there was a wrought iron nail embedded in it. And if you're in preservation, any kind of uh, nails are really good because they can help date. Um, so looking at this piece of wood and the microstructure here, we have a pretty distinctive piece of white oak. And how do we tell that? So the arrow there is pointing at what's called pyloses, which are these little um, film-like, looks like a bubble almost in some of the larger pores of the wood. Also really distinctive uh, rays uh, of, in the wood. Uh, so this is a, this, white oak is one of the only uh, wood, one of the few woods that has this particular pyloses. Uh. And then we took a look at the second piece of sheathing and this one, um, you can kind of tell the difference between the two, the oak is a hardwood and on this, this is a softwood. So we can tell that um, this is actually specific uh, southern yellow pine. We can tell that based on the, um, the resin canals, which the air is pointing out, and the really, really abrupt transition between late, uh, early and late woods. This is basically a really up close look at tree rings. So we have our, uh, our species defined, and we also can tell when they were from, and how can you, how can you determine that? Again, the nails really come in handy here. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to nerd out a little bit here because this is a topic of my thesis, uh, dating things based off of nails and other features. So this is an interesting field of study. It was actually um, really, really jettisoned by Henry Chapman Mercer, one of the leading arts and crafts figures uh, of, the, of the early part of the century up in Doylestown. So if you've ever been to the Mercer Museum, he has a whole bunch of old tools, old nails and things. It's a really interesting place. So he began the study where he took, I would think about 200 uh, barns and other farmhouses. And he went around, he took samples of all of these and based off of known data, based off of um, build dates, et cetera, he kind of started to formulate this, this use of dating by, by nails. Um, it was a good effort. He didn't get entirely correct, but he was a really, really pioneer in the field. There've been a couple of studies since then uh, that really look into this topic. Uh, the most recent one, the most complete, is the one by Tom Wells, featured on the right. So we can tell by these technically derivative features when nails were produced, basically, because we know, uh, based off of patents and things like that, uh, how the technology of creating and manufacturing nails has evolved. So earliest nails were made by hand, wrought iron nails. They would take this long bar, and you can see it's kind of like a almost looks like a tree. It's got these little pieces of slag kind of up and down in it. There's imperfections. Uh, it's not 
pure iron. So they would take a piece and they would hammer it on all four sides to make a point. They would cut it off and then they'd head it by hand by putting it into a header or part of an anvil here where you can see they would do four or five strikes to get that uh, head. And it's a pretty distinctive head, it's called a rose head. Uh, so later we go into some cut nails. Uh, so earlier cut nails um, were utilized, they have this, they heat up the slag and um, the iron and they put it through these narrow rollers. Now, whenever it goes through these rollers, the ends of the, the sheet kind of sag a little bit, which is why you can see on the top right there, there's a little bit of a curve. And notice that there's um, some of the slag, some of the imperfections, there's a graining to this sheet. It's not pure iron. So you can see here in the early ones that we, we have is, um, some, some, cross, uh, some uh, cross nails. So you can see the grain kind of goes across the nail like this. Um, there's a couple ways to cut these. You can either feed it through the shear machine by feeding it through, flipping it over, feeding it through, flipping it over, or just kind of wiggling it back and forth to get a particular kind of shape that you want that kind of diagonal shape. So based off of this, uh, the, the shearing machine uh, leaves behind these little burrs whenever it cuts down. It pushes the material through a little bit. So you get these little burrs, and whether they're on the same side or opposite sides, it can help determine like an earlier or a later cut nail. As technolo uh, technology progressed, um, we, we had these wider rollers. You can get the larger sheets. So what they would do was they, they would take these sheets and they would cut these nail plates. And, and here you can see that the way they cut it, now we have an inline grain. So the, the grain is going with the nails vertically. And you can also see that because the edges are cut, you don't have that particular slump at the edge. So all of these features are used to determine uh, um, dates of when they were applied. So including that piece of that nail that we had in, embedded in the wood, we took uh, 16 nail samples. Some really interesting um, uh, samples here. The first six um, were wrought iron nails. So these were nails that, as I mentioned, were cut, um, put, brought to a point, cut, and then headed by hand. Uh, two of these actually have some flat heads. They don't have that rose heads. They're actually uh, um, later nails. Uh, number two is really interesting. You think, why would that nail have that curve there? We found that. So these are called clinch nails. Um, so as you can imagine, if you have a, a diagonal and you nail it in, there, there is opportunity for things to move a little bit, can come undone. But if you take that nail and you kind of hammer it over and clinch it, then that also, that prevents it from separating and also kind of puts a little more tension on the wood. So it's, uh, it's really good for that. Um, these are all also interesting, uh, these chisel point nails. So this is used on really thin wood that you don't want to split. So you take that chisel point and you put it across the grain. Remember, if you think about uh, wood being a series of straws, you don't want to go through the straws because you're going to split it. You want to cut the straws and therefore you, that way you have some room, some wiggle room. It doesn't split the wood. And then we have a, had a series of cut nails. Um, these are all from anywhere from early 1800s to uh, early 1900s, depending on these features. So this is kind of just to show that we have a whole gambit here. They, they definitely upkept and worked on the roof. But that uh, helps us inform us that piece of wood uh, that had the nail embedded in it. Um, so that tells us that was part of the original campaign. It's a white oak. Uh, has the rose head, and then later sheathing campaigns, maybe whenever it was re-roofed in the 1750s, uh, they use a different kind of wood and different kinds of nails. Something we were also interested in uh, uh, documenting were these marriage marks. So lumber has to come from somewhere, it's not just from Home Depot. Uh, so um, whenever you make these, these joints and this joinery, you wanna, they're actually made specifically for each other, they're not really interchangeable. So carpenters would take these uh, marks and they would help them, they would mark the beams and that way they can, you know, not confuse which beam goes where and everything would fit exactly where it was. So these are marks are made with a, a timber scrag, which is in the bottom left or a racing knife. Um, and you can't really use, you know, regular um, numbers, like you can't make a figure eight in woods hard to make curves. And then also Roman numerals aren't quite there as well either because they it gets longer and longer and longer. And you know, have a finite piece of wood to 
to mark so that they actually had their own system of marking these pieces. Uh, so if you look on the left, this is from uh, building the Georgian city. And you can see the V, the five uh, underneath, anywhere where there's a cross of the vertical and the horizontal, is that, is that, at that crossing point, that's a 10. So 10, 20, 3, 10, 20, 30, 40, little V for the five, eight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is, isn't quite the same system that we found at Stenton. A lot of carpenters kind of had their own, um, their own particular, you know, idiosyncratic uh, kind of marks. So these are really interesting to document and try to, to figure out, you know, what the sequencing was. Uh, we also looked at the joinery. Uh, we had access to the one side, the one corner of the roof here. Um, we did a visual and a hands-on inspection. It was really, really good. This is a good old growth uh, oak. Uh, no visible signs of rot. Really, you know, standard joinery though. So I didn't really get a good picture, unfortunately, but we did see um, some marks on the wood itself, uh, sawing marks, and this can also help the date as well. Uh, so I believe um, in the HSR it mentions that uh, Logan had his own pit saw on site whenever he was constructing uh, Stenton. So a pit saw is what you see here on the left. It's actually a pit, or there might be these large um, horses, and this is how they would make boards out of larger pieces of lumber. So because they're going at an angle here, if it's an angular saw mark, you can tell that's a pit saw. Um, whereas later saws, the up and down saw mills leave a, a fairly you know, straight up and down circular saws come later. So this is really helpful as well. So we uh, found a lot of those kind of diagonal markings on some of the original uh, um, wood members. So this is really where um, institutional knowledge comes in handy. Um, Laura knew off the top of her head that uh, this chimneys had been rebuilt uh, by George Edmund Brembaugh and then other work had been done by Dickey. In the, so Brembaugh was a pretty a uh, well-respected restoration architect in the 1950s. There wasn't really a lot of them. And then Dickey was kind of the same thing, but he came a little bit later in the 70s and 80s. And they both worked on the site. I believe Brumbaugh's wife, I think, was uh, part of the Colonial Dames, and therefore he was involved in Stenton that way. But he also offered his services, usually free of charge, um, for you know, restoration projects. So we knew initially that um, Brumbaugh had been involved. And there actually is a collection of his papers up at the Winterthur Library. Uh, so I went up there and we knew that he had uh, put in bathrooms into that, uh, the service wing. So it was really interesting to see, you know, the, the drawings for all these bathrooms. And they also built part of the chimney in the service wing. You can see a receipt in the bottom there for uh, constructing the chimney and installing a heating system. So what does this have to do with the main house? It's here that we find that they used a product called hydroxide color coat to stop water from infiltrating around a leaky skylight. So this is the, the, fir the first instance of them saying that they've used uh, a uh, waterproofing material in the past. So this was whenever they did the, um, the project for the service wing in the 1956 and 57. Um, around that time, they were interested in putting heat into the mansion itself. So this is a really interesting concept. So uh, um, Brumbaugh was working with Charles Leopold, an engineer, who came up with this idea that they would have a hot water heater in the basement and this uh, whole system of uh, blower, hot water blowers in the attic where they would blow hot, uh, hot air down through the fireplaces and recirculate up through the rest of the house via the stairwells. Really interesting concept. This is, may have changed a little bit uh, based off of this is the initial design phase, uh, you could say, this introduction of heating. And here you can see um, kind of how that air might have recirculated a little bit. Um, so because they were dealing with the roof, uh, they, um, Brumbaugh started to investigate some of the chimneys. Now, it, and whenever he was investigating in the 50s, late 50s, he said at some time in the past, the chimneys had been rebuilt already. So he's, there had already been precedent for rebuilding the chimneys. Um, so he did a condition assessment, an early condition assessment of the chimneys. He found that 
there were some a lot of cracking that the, the, all of the top parts seemed to be pulling away from the center of the chimney. He determined that it was best to simply just disassemble, carefully document, disassemble, and reassemble the chimneys. So here we can see um, on the left is looking down, uh, if you can see through the roof, there's two air moving units. They cut through the chimneys uh, so they could uh, put the air um, to go down through the flues. If you look on the lower right, you can see that they're, they would have sealed the chimneys off to prevent anything from coming in. The chimneys were no longer functional um, and they cut into the chimneys a little bit to allow for that ventilation system. Um, I find it really interesting that, you know, not all, not all contractors are uh, observant of historic structures, but Brumbaugh was really, really aware that this is an important historic site. He didn't want to screw it up. So if you look at the, the last paragraph there, uh, he calls the attention to the historic importance of the building. So he's very, very particular about who was able to cut into what pieces and for how much. Uh, so, and it was very particular, make sure there's no damage to other parts of the house, no chance of fire, etc. So they rebuilt the chimneys. Uh, he has this nice uh, after document, but there, he didn't mention uh, any kind of hydro uh, in a, a waterproofing whenever he uh, did this final document, uh, but there is the precedent before of the same team whenever they were working on the, the service wing that they used that that particular um, material. So it, that based uh, coupled with the physical results that we found pretty clearly indicates that they used some kind of waterproofing on the chimneys. Uh, so in the previous re-roofing efforts in the 1980s, uh, Dickey, who helped uh, write the historic structures report, that other restoration architect, uh, did a really, really great uh, documentation of the roofing structure. Um, and it, it is pretty accurate to, from what we can tell, um, with the exception of if you look on the left where our, um, our actual drawing is, there were just, an, there's an extra joist there. They just missed one joist trying to make it symmetric. Maybe it was not quite the same as the other side, and he was trying to make the drawing symmetric, I'm not sure. Uh, and he also had these really interesting um, isometric views. And we, can, we found uh, based off of the, that, that he, he documented this pretty well. Um, so you can see that the corner piece coming in, and then the, the first beam uh, to the right of that on the left photo is this one where it has this tusk ton, uh, tenon. And this, this is uh, actually um, adhered with a peg. And this is, this is a dual tenon system. It's not just one. So everything after that is a lap dovetail joint. Uh, if you look at the, on the photo on the far right, uh, this kind of like diagonal dovetail joint. That's to prevent it from moving horizontally. It can't pull out anymore. And then the lower tenon was actually move, uh, there to prevent vertical movement as well. That way it couldn't just pop out of the top of the joint. Uh, so um, the U Penn students, uh, some of them were working on the log cabin at Stenton and some of them were working uh, on the shingling project uh, and you're trying to figure out, you know, a good course of action to go with this. So they did some good research. So obviously fire is an issue whenever you have a, a, a flammable roofing material, especially in urban areas, but because uh, Stenton was so far, uh, far removed from urban areas at this point, they could have a wood uh, shingle uh, roof without any problem, really. Um, so they started delving into this research of what kind of products they, you know, that were used on uh, roofings at this time. So actually, early roofers uh, took a, a page of some shipbuilding uh, manuals, and they would coat it uh, with a, um, like a boiled linseed oil, and they, they could uh, make it different colors. So they can kind of tint it a little bit to have a little artistic uh, um, influence on it. And this is a, they were trying to find relevant examples of things at the same time. Um, this wasn't quite the same time, but uh, Mount Vernon that's historically painted red, red uh, ceiling. Um, this is interesting. Uh, they found a quote uh, from this uh, traveler that says that they're all that all the roofs in Phil uh, were painted brown, red, dark blue, blue, etc. So that there is, you know, 
historically, these roofs were painted uh, sometimes, not always, but we were trying to find evidence of that. So this was interesting where an early, earlier uh, document from 1798 that talks about um, uh, fish oil mixing in the paint and pigment, pigment needed to be a Spanish brown color, which is pretty typical for colonial uh, times. So they actually did a pan analysis in the 80s uh, where they found that the original, the original paint material in the dormers was a reddish brown. Uh, so they, they uh, Dickey said that this, uh, this coloring had kind of penetrated into the wood grain really well. There wasn't a lot of weathering on it. There was a, a, a red-brown primer layer and a red-brown top layer. So these dormers were initially that color, so it's possible that the roof would be tinted to match. So unfortunately, they don't have all of the ledgers um, available from Logan. But it's interesting that this might be future research um, to look, go back and look at um, uh, like receipts and things like that to see what was ordered and maybe um, how much of that would have covered a certain square footage. Is it just for the dormers? Was there enough for the entire roof, etc.? So there's some interesting future research to be had. So the students, uh, they decided to make this test panel. They got the same shingles the roofers were using, the same um, Fuji Picada, uh, the, red, the Western Red Cedar, and they are making this test panel. And like Laura mentioned, they, were, they did a lot of research of what kind of materials could be used to coat and extend the life of the shingles. So they proposed this uh, treatment with three different products, uh, Timbor, which is an insecticide and fungicidal preservative, uh, total wood preservative, which protects against water penetration and UV, and then fire stop, which is a fire retardant, but they would be painted on the underside of the shingles so you wouldn't see it. So this test panel is gonna be put on the grounds of Stenton, it's the same atmospheric conditions and everything. That way they can kind of monitor the results, uh, see if it's effective, if it's not, what could be done otherwise. And if it is effective, there's a possibility that this could be implemented on Stenton's roof in the future. So what's up next for the chimneys? So this water that caught my eye earlier, once we found out there was a water coating, a water preventive coating on this, it was on both the joints and the brick faces. So this is the, the evidence that because it had rained three days earlier, that water had been getting into the interior of the, of the chimney somehow and being stuck there. It doesn't have a chance to breathe because of that waterproof coating. So it's actually coming out of these tiny little micro cracks at the uh, interfaces between the brick and the joint. So that's why you can see it's kind of along all of those little interfaces there. So that's the water coming out three days later in a nice sunny day. Um, this is not good. Water retention in masonry is never good. You want it to be able to breathe, especially old masonry, uh, particularly in the winter time. Whenever if water is trapped in there, it's going to go through that freeze-thaw cycle, and when water freezes, it's going to expand and kind of break apart those materials. So it's really hard to remove a, uh, a hydrophobic coating, especially from brick faces. Uh, for instance, we don't want to do any kind of blasting. Uh, for, we don't want, to don't want to remove that fire skin at all. So what we're recommending is doing a little bit of a mortar study. We took a sample of the mortar here and we digested it in acid so we could see the type of uh, the aggregate to binder ratio, the type of aggregate that was used. Obviously we know it's not historic because the uh, chimneys were completely rebuilt, but we wanna compare this information with um, if we can find some actual historic mortar from the house. Uh, and that way we can see, uh, we, we're recommending that we rake out those joints and repoint it, and that way the joints will be a breathable location to allow that water to go in and out uh, a little bit better. Uh, so we were suggesting a study of the mortar of the house and to maybe do some more rylan testing on the house itself to see if it was just the chimneys that was coated or if there are other areas that might have had that same uh, problem as well. Oh, and I think that's it. So I really hope you guys appreciated that. And I think if there's questions, um, we'll see. Yes. Hello again. <laughs>
I do see um, a question. Kathy Dowdell says, are you actually contemplating painting the red roof? Um, we haven't started to get to those kinds of discussions yet. We've been talking about whether we want to, um, at a very basic level, at least do some of the more protective coatings, like the, teeth, the total wood protection um, and, and the fire coating. Um, I know that from an aesthetic point of view, it will be a huge discussion to think about actually um, painting the shingles and weighing how much evidence we have both from Stenton and other sites. Um, in the 1990s, Richard Wolbers did a paint study of the, the mansion exterior. And there was one of the, the main conclusion he had was that there was very little original paint even left. Um, he had a hard time assessing whether he was really finding original paint. And he thought the red that he found in other locations was a primer and that this, these um, sort of stone colored white were more what the house was painted through most of its history. So it's hard to know. The house, if you look at some um, images of Stanton that were published in the 90s, like the Worldly Goods Catalog from the Philadelphia Museum of Arts 1999 exhibition has an image of Stenton in it where the, the wood trim was all red. And, um, and some Chester County brick houses have red trim too. And it's, an, it's a very different look. You know, there's just not that same contrast between the wood and the brick. Um, so I know from an aesthetic point of view, there, could, there would be a lot of um, hemming and hawing about that. It was hard, it was every time we do a period paint color, there, there's always somebody who thinks it's really hideous along the way. Um, but people get used to it too. So, um, you know, no, we don't have immediate plans to, to color the roof, but maybe. Rick asked a question, um, how different are the characteristics of the new shingles from the earlier generations of shingles? And what was the basis of selection for the new shingles? Well, and Sarah, you might be able to weigh in a little bit here too about the wood, but um, the earlier shingles were much, were longer, even, even though we have, I forget now exactly how many inches ours are. I think it's around 20 maybe, or 18. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head but it's really difficult to get three foot long shingles um, today without sort of having them completely handcrafted. And um, it, it, it's a cost question really for us to just be able to afford having new shingles. And um, as Dennis and I were making decisions about it too, um, in part, you know, having seen Mount Pleasant was re-roofed, um, this might be it was as many as 15 years ago maybe, and has beautifully crafted shingles, um, but also has had more issues with leaking. It was really important to us that we knew we had a really tight roof on the house um, as we were looking at this. But Sarah, you might have a comment. Um, I believe I recall that one of the appendices of the HSR is uh, some portions of the Logan ledgers. Um, I believe it said they were cedar shingles. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly, but I believe that's the case. Um, the only the only difference would be this: they wouldn't have used western red cedar, so the the coloring might be a little different. But the cedar is used because it has this, this kind of like like an extractive oil. It's actually really really good preservative for the wood. Uh, most bugs don't like cedar, um, so it, it's good for those qualities. Yeah, the um, cedar that was used in the 18th century in Philadelphia, I think, in large measure, came from um, sort of central New Jersey, like the, the kind of Pine Barrens region, there was a lot of, of Atlantic white cedar there. And um, sometime if you're interested, Rick, we can pull out the drawers from the Maple High Chest when you're at Stenton because the, the drawer bottoms are made of Atlantic white cedar and it would be the same wood that the, the shingles would have originally been made from. We have a question in the Q&A from Margaret. What specifications were followed or looked to for the roof installation? Were there detailed plans or materials from the 80s roof and were any changes made from the last installation? Yeah, there were not detailed specifications other than to reuse as much material as possible and to only apply new sheathing where necessary to be sure you could for the roofers to be sure they could make um, a good fit. 
I don't, Sarah, from your being up on the roof while they were doing it, do you have any sense of any other guiding principles they might have been using? Uh, it seemed they use, they, like they were using traditional um, methods and uh, like chalk lines to make sure they have a nice straight line. Um, a lot of times they, oh, shingles usually only have one, um, one nail through them and then they share the nails of the ones that kind of overlap on top. So it's a little more fixed that way from, I think that's what they were doing, but I, I wasn't keeping close tabs on them. And it looked like too that they, when they were putting in the new sheathing that they were using screws rather than right. nails. Right, which again, it could also be helpful in the future, you know, for people who are uh, fastener nerds be like, oh yeah, this is obviously a newer piece. This screw is from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Nicole. Does Stenton save, preserve, accession samples of old materials removed or altered during projects like these? We do. And um, it hasn't always been consistently done, but the things that we've been sampling as part of this project Materials Conservation Act still has them, but we want to make sure that they are permanently archived at Stenton. Uh, regarding Logan's original shingles, do we know how long it would have taken for the shingles to be handmade, where they were made, et cetera? Well, we do have that referenced, that 1720s ledger reference that I showed that said it was the Germantown Mill. and. Um, I'm not exactly sure where that was, whether it was on, but it was probably on the Wingahawking Creek somewhere that there, there's a, a sawmill of wood nearby where they were being manufactured for lots of Germantown construction. Um, how do you balance authenticity versus cost versus durability when working on historic buildings? Sarah, do you want to go first? <laughs> well, obviously, so, you know, one thing you can take away from this is that um, we're working towards answers, but we don't have all of them. Uh, so we do the best that we can as far as, you know, recommending uh, products. Um, is, you know, like I said, the cedar is a really, really good material for the, um, the shingling, and there is some precedent for having that cedar there. Um, I mean, this, this is also regulated by the Historical Commission as well. So, I mean, they would not be happy with, you know, throwing up a metal seam roofing or anything on this. You know, there is some regulation as well, uh, some oversight to make sure that things are done, you know, as much as possible to, um, to replace in kind, basically. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I, I think it is always that there is, there are, um, always little choices along the way you have to make where it's not absolutely authentic, but it's as authentic as you can be within the confines of, of current conditions and budget. And um, sometimes we can't get materials anymore that we're done. Um, and as, as Sarah pointed out, you know, we're looking at these coatings and um, total wood protection, things like that have been around a long time and it's known how well they react, but um, even Sort of Brumbaugh's coatings, um, I know as a curator, not being someone who has a deep mastery of, of the chemistry or um, some of the, the newer materials, I'm always leery of um, the newest technology. You know, I'd like to see the newest technology 10 years from now before I put on a building that I'm stewarding because I, I really want to see what its long -term, longer term effects are. Um, because, you know, here we have Brumbaugh's coating that, you know, you could say maybe it, it worked really well on the chimneys for a certain amount of time. Um, we don't have a lot of documentation about why he chose to use it, um, but it's causing real problems now that we have to deal with. And would we be better off if he had simply used a softer mortar? Maybe the chimneys would have already had to have been rebuilt again, or we'd be, be facing it from that perspective. It's hard to say, but every time we go through time and we make an intervention, the people who come after us have to live with those consequences. And so it's really, you know, building materials of this, these traditional types of building materials are meant to be renewable and houses are meant to be repointed and re-roofed. And um, so to the greatest extent possible, 
we want to stick with traditional ways of, of maintaining. So I think that's probably fair to say was one of our kind of guiding principles at Benton. And this is why you do these kind of studies as, as well as not just to figure things out, but also for the documentation further down the road, definitely. Yeah, so in another 50 years, there are going to be different people sitting here saying, well, Sarah Gadula, and Andrew Fearon, and Laura Kime thought X, and, you know, they will be figuring out what to do next in terms of what we've left behind for them. So, yeah, we try to be just very conscious that we're not just feeling in the present, that we're also feeling in the future when we make our decisions. I think Any other, is that it for questions, Rachel? I think so. Okay. Well, I'm very grateful to Sarah, um, you know, for her work and the, the research and their product and for, for doing this for us today. This has made a really informative program. And I think, um, I don't know how many of our kind of colonial dames are able to join us, but I know that our buildings committee will be really grateful to have access to this too, you know, to be at their their leisure to um, see inside the thinking and research behind the project. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.